Today we're going to be talking about representing, representing Christ. And this message came about because um, I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago in here, and I was just telling them about a time where I'm driving down the road, and I think I've probably told you guys this before. It's one of the most embarrassing stories of mine about me. But uh, I'm driving down the road and talking a text message, right? Anybody ever do that? No. <laughs> you and Lonnie. Um, I'm talking this text message, and as I'm, as I'm going down the road, I'm next to a semi, and this person's coming down the ramp next to me, and they, they literally, it looked... I'm like, oh man, they are not slowing down, and I can't, I can't like speed up or slow down because I'm kind of boxed in too. And they're coming over, man, and they are just not planning on stopping. And I mean, I have to like swerve, and there's a semi right here, and I mean, it was just so close. And I dropped my phone literally, and uh, out of my mouth came a few explicit statements, um, and. What's that? (laughs) Somebody's tongues. But uh, the text that I was sending was to one of my bosses and a female co-worker. Um, And as I go to grab my phone, it hits sins. It hits sin. And... uh, I pick it up, and I, I mean, you know, everything's good. I didn't hit the semi or anything, and then I look at my phone. I'm like, no, 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 no. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. you got to be kidding. No, no, no. And I thought, how in the world did that come out of this mouth, this mouth? I mean, I've been, I've been redeemed. I've been changed, you know, like my heart's been renewed. My mind's been renewed. What, how did that come out of my mouth? Like, I didn't even remember speaking it. But it was bad, like it was bad. And it's, if I say it's bad, it was bad, you know? And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I, I immediately uh, start, start sending a text and, and my boss sends back, I assume you didn't mean to send that. And I'm like, no, I absolutely did not mean to send that. Um, and I mean, I was, I was so embarrassed, desperately embarrassed. And I get to work, and, and uh, my boss is standing there at the door. And now, keep in mind, he's a former Force Recon Marine, um, a uh, Arizona State Trooper, drug interdiction, uh, SWAT, you know, undercover dude. Like, he's been there and done that, and there's nothing he hasn't heard. But at the same time, there was a sweet lady that I worked with that was also on that end of the text, and that, no matter what, it's not good. No matter what, you know. And my boss, he's a, a redeemed Christian as well. And uh, so I get there, and he's standing there at the door. And he just starts laughing as I'm walking up. And I'm like, I'm thinking this is not funny, you know. It's not funny. Um, and so I said, hey, can we just act like that never happened? He goes, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's, it never happened. So I get back to my desk, and he had printed it out and taped it on my computer screen. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I'm never going to live this down, you know? So I'm telling this story a couple weeks ago, and, you know, I'm just I'm trying to convey that sometimes we slip. You know, sometimes we, we mess up, but then my good friend Michael Jones came up after that service and he said, hey, um, you know, I just wanted to encourage you that no matter where we are, we always represent the king. And he's 100% right, 100% right. We always represent the king and we have to do our very best to to truly renew our hearts, renew our minds. And I want to be in a place where even if something crazy like that happens, 
But that's not what comes out of my mouth anymore. You know, this was a couple of years ago, but I can't say that it, it wouldn't right now even. You know, I'm, I'm trying to work on those things to where, to where even sub, subliminally, you know, subconsciously, my mind immediately speaks out the Word of God, speaks out truth, you know. And so when he said we, we represent the king wherever we are, it's not just wherever we are, it's whenever we're there, wherever we are. No matter who we're around, even if nobody's around, nobody was around there. But you know who was around? The Holy Spirit, who's right there with me. God says that he never leaves us. He doesn't forsake us. So even when I'm alone in my car, he's right there with me. I don't want to be speaking out something that's going to dishonor him because he's always with me. So it just, um, I've been, I mean, I've been thinking about that probably every day since you've said that, Michael, you know, and I thank you so much for saying that because we all need to remember that. It's, it's extremely important for us. And so it was maybe that night even that I'm, I'm lying in bed and, and I, well, it was actually the middle of the night, so I'd fallen asleep and God woke me up. And started talking to me about representing him. And he started showing me, he was talking to me about embassies and about um, ambassadors. And the word says that we are ambassadors of Christ. And so I started just scribbling stuff down in the middle of the night. Honestly, I didn't even turn my light on. I grabbed my notepad. Uh, have you ever tried to write something without looking at your paper? Sometimes it works out well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, fortunately, I was able to read pretty much all of it. But um, he really just started downloading stuff into my heart. So I want to just cover some of that stuff with you guys today. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will just open up our minds and our eyes and our hearts and our ears, Lord, to be able to receive what it is that you have for us today. God, I pray that you will speak through me that you will anoint these words and that you will allow to come forth what you want to come forth, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So because he's talking, he was talking to me about being an ambassador and I wanted to really go into what an ambassador is and, and what embassies are across the world and, and make that connection between Christians and ambassadors, you know, U.S. ambassadors, and churches and embassies, and look at the kind of the comparison, because really the way that the U.S. has designed and created our laws and our procedures and stuff like that, most of it is biblical if you go all the way back to the beginning. Some of those things are changing nowadays, but that's all right. We'll, uh, we'll let God deal with that. So there are 153 embassies, U.S. embassies across the globe, 153. There's 192 U.S. ambassadors. And if you don't know what an ambassador is, an ambassador is an individual nominated by the President of the United States to serve as the nation's representative. An embassy... Oh, you know what, they're also, their goal, their job is to ensure that their nation's interests are well represented and safeguarded abroad. So think about if that's an ambassador's job, and God calls us to be ambassadors of Christ, then that's, that's also what we're supposed to do. An ambassador is an individual nominated by the president. We as Christians have been nominated by God. I'll dig into that a little bit deeper here in a minute. But they ensure that their nation's interests are well represented and safeguarded. So I, I just want to ask you guys a question. And believe me, I've been asking me this for quite some time now. Do you well represent Christ? Do you well represent Him? If He's... If, if truly he's standing right there with you, 
Are people going to see that reflection of you and him, of him and you? Are you going to represent him well? An embassy assists citizens who travel to or live in the host country. So we don't have U.S. embassies here in the U.S. because we are the U.S. But our embassies are abroad. They're all over the place where the United States is not. But everywhere that there's a U.S. embassy on that spot, that is considered the United States. Once you cross that threshold, you are considered in the country of the United States. You, that's, that's what it is. Okay? And so embassies assist citizens who travel to there or live in the host country. U.S. Foreign uh, Service officers also interview citizens of the host country who wish to travel to the United States for business, education, tourism, whatever. Anybody that's going to be coming here, that's one of their, their jobs that they're supposed to do. Some ways that they help are obvious and others aren't so obvious. U.S. embassies issue visas to promote international visit to the United States while maintaining our border security. So they determine who gets to come in and not. They work out trade agreements that help lower our costs for purchasing the goods that, um, that we purchase from there. Close consultations with foreign governments can stop an illness from becoming a pandemic. And skillful negotiations can prevent a small conflict from spiraling into war. They provide immediate and personal assistance to American citizens every day around the world, replacing lost uh, passports, assisting injured or ill travelers, and assisting with marriages, births, and adoptions. Did you guys know that U.S. embassies do that all over the world? We've got... 153 embassies that do that. So think about that in, in perspective of what the, the church does. Where are we located? We're located all across the world. I'm going to give you some numbers today, though, that indicate churches here in the United States, Christians here in the United States, because if we are ambassadors we are, as Christians, are ambassadors for Christ Jesus, then these churches where people get to go should be safe havens. They should do all the things that these embassies do as well. So think about it this way. The church, the building of the church, we are all the church, but the building of the church, we should promote travel to where we're representing. If people want to go to heaven, if they want to have a relationship with Christ, they should know that they can come here, and once they get here, this is going to be that safe place. This is going to be that place that people are going to help them get to where they want to go. They work out trade agreements to help lower cost on things. They also... Um, consult foreign governments to help stop it, uh, illnesses from becoming pandemics. They, they negotiate over small conflicts so that they don't turn into war. Think about, think about that as far as, as Christians in a church. So that means that what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to help provide for them to have a better way of life. Okay? We're supposed to Help pray for the sick. Heal the dead. Cast out demons. These, this says that, that the embassies, they literally help to mitigate and make sure that illnesses don't spread everywhere. That's, that's also what we're supposed to be doing here. The exact same thing. And then, and then they, they um, mitigate issues so that they don't turn into huge wars. That's what we're supposed to do here inside the church for our people. If we don't do that and, and these issues blow up and they just rage out of control, nobody's going to think that they want to go 
where we are guaranteed that we're going to be going if we, if we maintain this relationship with God. They're not going to want to come here in order to be able to get there. They're going to try to circumvent it and find their own ways, you know? They're going to be watching Oprah, and she's going to tell them that they can get to heaven no matter how they want, that all roads lead to heaven. But that's just not true. It's simply not true. And it's our job to make sure that we are fighting for them, that we're negotiating for them, that we are petitioning our Father in heaven to help these people. Replacing lost passports, what would that look like? What would that look like, you know? Would that not be trying to bring that, that lost sheep back? There's, man, there's so far I want to go, but it's like. Assisting injured or ill travelers. I don't even, I don't even look at this as in, as in physical illness. That is something. You know, that's part of it. But this is a different part of it. Assisting injured or ill travelers. People that, that we know have hurts, you know, habits, hang-ups. People that we know have been church hurt. Have you ever heard that phrase before? If you haven't, you should probably think about it. Because a lot of people in this world have been church hurt. And so they don't want to come to church. Because they think that, we're, that everybody in churches are a big bunch of hypocrites. And honestly... People do get hurt in churches. They do. But we're supposed to be helping to assist them to help make them better, to make them feel better, to make them um, realize who the true, the great physician is. They should be able to come here to, to know that once they get here, they're going to be able to receive all the help that they need. And assisting them with marriages, births, and adoptions, that's neat, man. But that's exactly what we're supposed to do, too. Exactly what we're supposed to do as Christians, especially in this house of God. So there are 153 embassies and 192 ambassadors for the United States across the, across the globe. In the United States alone, there's roughly 400,000 churches. 400,000 churches. We have 50 states. 400,000 churches. Does this nation act like or look like there's 400,000 churches here? If they were all doing what the, what the Word of God tells us to do, I think that this country would look totally different. Totally different. In the United States alone... There's approximately 210 million people that claim that Christ is their Savior, claim to be Christians. 210 million people. In 2021, that was approximately 63% of the total population of the United States. The total population was 332 million, and 210 claimed to be Christians. There's a big difference between claiming something and being something. Like Michael said, we represent the king wherever we go. Just because 210 million people say, I'm a Christian, doesn't mean that they're representing the king. Doesn't mean they're acting like it, walking like it, talking like it. Doesn't mean that they're representing the king. If, if all 210 million today started representing the king, this whole world would be drastically different. Drastically different. Hebrews 10, 10 through 12 says, We have been set apart as holy because Jesus Christ did what God the Father wanted him to do by sacrificing his body once and for all. Deuteronomy 14, 2 says, You have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God. He has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. That was in Deuteronomy. 
talking about how the nation of Israel has been chosen, set apart. And then the word tells us that we have been grafted into that, that we are truly set apart, that we are a royal priesthood. And not only are we a royal priesthood, that he chose us as his own special treasure. (laughs) That's amazing. The God of all creation chose us as his special treasure. I know oftentimes we don't feel like we are a special treasure. I certainly didn't feel like it when I looked at that phone and it said sent. You know, I didn't feel like a special treasure. Uh, I felt a little tarnished, a little beat up, a little worse for wear. But it says that we have been set apart as holy because Jesus Christ did what God the Father wanted him to do by sacrificing his body once and for all. It doesn't say that we've been set apart because Nathan's been super good and never sent a bad text. Thankfully. It says that we've been set apart because Jesus was doing what the Father wanted him to do. And he gave up his life his body once and for all so that we can be saved. So embassies and churches, they're both under attack physically and spiritually. Can anybody think of a time where an embassy came under attack and it made world news? Probably one of the first is Benghazi. You know, there's several in Africa that have been under attack. People... People don't like what the U.S. stands for because it stands for freedom, uh, freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, all kinds of freedoms. Well, the enemy doesn't want that. The enemy doesn't want that. He wants to steal and kill and destroy. He doesn't want us to live in freedom. He wants us to live in fear so that we're focused on him and not on God so that we don't go to the Father. Who gives us freedom? Who gives us a free will? Who allows us to be able to make choices and decisions on our own so that we can truly be free? The enemy doesn't want that, though. He wants us to feel attacked. He wants us to live in fear. And Benghazi was a huge, a huge issue around the world, you know? And all of America was in an uproar because it came under attack. If a, if a United States embassy is considered America, wherever it is, then America comes under attack when it gets attacked. Benghazi was attacked. Four American men were killed. That, that made big news. Churches come under attack across the world. Every day. Every day. I'm not just talking on Sundays. I'm talking every day. But since 2017, between 2017 and 2019, approximately 12,390 violent crimes were carried out in churches with roughly 576,597 victims. Do you hear about that? Rarely. Rarely. The enemy doesn't want to make a big deal out of it. You know why? Because whenever the church comes under persecution, the church actually grows. I know it seems a little backwards. It does. It seems a little backwards, but it's true. So from 2017 to 2021, approximately 12,390 violent attacks happened in churches in the United States alone. Just in the U.S. A friend of mine is, was, he just retired, as the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. That's the location of the largest um, church massacre on United States soil ever documented. This was on November 5th, 2017. He and his wife were gone. 
a lot of the other um, protectors were gone as well. And 26 people were murdered, brutally murdered, in that church that day. Half of those were children. Over half were children. One of which was the senior pastor, Frank Pomeroy's daughter. She was 14. You know, we, we don't like to think about it. We don't like to talk about it. But churches truly are under attack. Christians truly are under attack. You know what, what Satan was trying to do that day and all, those, all these other attacks between then and now? He was trying to make us scared to go to church. He was trying to make us in fear uh, um, to even go and worship God. But we can't live in fear. Just like we can't stop having embassies across the, the world, we can't stop having ambassadors across the world. There are lots of pastors that have been, uh, have been murdered in their church even since 2017. But that doesn't mean we stop going to church. It doesn't mean we stop preaching the Word of God. It doesn't mean that we stop doing what God's called us to do. It means that we have to remember that everywhere we are, we represent the Father. Everywhere. And we can't stop even if we come under attack. Pew Research Center reported that in 1972, 90% of Americans claimed to be Christians. In, with the current rate of decline, by 2070, if it stays exactly the way it is right now, only 35% will even claim to be Christians. In 2070, will even claim to be Christians. I would venture to say that, that there's a big possibility that that could drop off a lot if people don't stand their ground, if people don't stand firm in the Word of God and truly live out what God has called them to live out. How can we change this? How can we change these statistics? We have to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. We have to be rooted and grounded in our relationship with Him, knowing that He loves us more than anything, knowing that He laid His life down for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He literally sent His only Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. He laid down His life for us so that we can have this relationship with Him. If we, if we just have a, a little closet relationship with him in our own home and we're too afraid to, to uh, talk to people about God and about what he's done in our lives, then these numbers are going to continue to drop. If we only get out of our house and come to church and only claim to be Christians right here, then these numbers are going to continue to drop. If we don't talk about him, we don't share him, we don't show the world who he is through who he is in us, then we're letting people just go on, just walk right to like lambs to the slaughter. And they don't have a hope. We are their hope. We're their only hope. We are Christ's embodiment here on earth. First John 3.16, which I think that it's interesting that there's John 3.16 that talks about um, God so loved the world and what Jesus did and what God did for us. But then you look at 1 John three sixteen through 17, and it's for us, what we can do, what we can do, what we should do. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? 
if Christ himself came and gave everything that he is, everything that he is, even the, his own life, it says that he cried out and gave up his spirit. He gave everything for us. And this tells us that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You know who our brothers and sisters are? You guys. Jesus says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Those who do the will of the Father are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Those who do the will of the Father. And this is telling us that this is how we do it. By loving others, by laying down our own selfish desires, our own wants and all these things, laying them down whenever it's uncomfortable to share the gospel, whenever it's uncomfortable to look like Christ because we might be persecuted, because we might be made fun of, because we might even lose our lives. That's what we're, we're supposed to do. Love people. Love our brothers and sisters. Give to them if they're in need. That can be difficult. I, know, I understand that. It can be difficult. But it's what we're called to do. And we don't have to do it very long. I mean, this life is just, boom. I love how the Word gives us instruction. It lays things out for us. It tells us what we should do, how we should do it, what we should watch out for. How we should deal with things whenever we do watch out for it and we do see things tells us how to be able to walk out this relationship with God effectively. I'm telling you, the most important thing is love, but we can't neglect the other things as well. Acts 20, 28 through 30 says, and um, this is instruction for us. So just like... We know that somebody came into First Baptist Church, Sutherland Springs, and started killing people. Just like we know all these places have been attacked from the outside, we also get attacked from the inside. It says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. He bought us with his own blood. I know after I leave... Paul is talking here. He says, I know after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. We have, we have got to be aware that, that we will be under spiritual attack. From the outside, from the inside, Satan hates us. He wants to steal from us. He wants to kill us. He wants to destroy us, all of us. We look like God. We are like God. We've been created in His image and His likeness, and He wants to stop that as much as He can. So I encourage you guys, as all of us as Christians, as representatives of Christ, be on the lookout. Be aware. I know for me personally, it's like, okay, okay, what can I watch for? Who's, who's coming at me? Well, Satan might be trying to attack you personally. He might be trying to weave in thoughts and ideas in your own mind to cause division. A house divided cannot stand, right? So Paul says, be on the lookout for that. Romans 13, 11 through 14 says, And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. It's easy to gratify the desires of the flesh, to want to, to be drawn to that, to want what's fun and, and makes us feel good. The Word says that there is fun in sin for a season. 
Even sin is fun for a season. All of us have been there before, right? Haven't all of us um, thought doing something that we used to do was really fun, and now we look back and go, oh, my goodness. What was I thinking? It was fun. But if you're, if you're really honest with yourself, it brought a lot of pain too, didn't it? I know it brought a whole lot of pain in my life, big time. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18 says, and most of you all have heard this before, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness put in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, keep up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Did you catch that? Who can, ex who can extinguish? You can. You can extinguish the arrows, the flaming arrows of the enemy with this. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Guys, I know that, that you all have probably heard these things before. You've heard this, this, these verses before. But they're so extremely important. Because without these things, how can we survive? If he tells us that this is what we must do, if we don't do them, do we stand a chance? He wouldn't tell us that we needed to do these things if it wasn't absolutely necessary. So what does this look like? What does it actually mean? He's saying put on the full armor of God. When our soldiers, our warriors go out to battle, they don't just run out without having on their armor. In fact, if they do try to go out, they're going to get in big trouble for it by their command because they know that they're way more likely to sustain serious physical injury or even die without it. So with the belt of truth, what would a belt of truth do for you? It will help you to recognize lies. It will help you to understand that this is actual truth because Satan tries to twist that truth. He tries to lie to you. He tries to whisper stuff in your ears and make you think that, there, that something's happening or something's being said that's really not. He doesn't want us to fall into these lies. So he says, put on this belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. A breastplate of righteousness protects your heart. It protects your vital organs. Back then, the, the Roman soldiers, they wore all kinds of really elaborate armor. And I heard that, that they would shine their breastplates. It, it covered from here down to here. And they would shine them to where they were really, really bright. Well, if it's really, really bright... That doesn't give you a tactical advantage if you're trying to not be seen. But when would they go out to battle? Did they ever fight at night? No. They fought in the middle of the day. So if they're going out in the middle of the day and their breastplates are real bright and shiny and the sun is shining down onto them, it's going to look like my head does to you guys right now. It's going to be blinding, right? So these, they would shine them up to distract the enemy so that you can see what you're doing, but they can't see what they're doing and where they're going. Have you ever been driving down the road and the sun's like right there in your eyes? And you're like, oh man, you can't hardly see anything? 
It's really hard to do anything if you're being distracted. Well, this breastplate of righteousness also protects your vital organs. And, and living a life of righteousness, consistently putting that on and being deliberate to put that on, it's going to help you to not fall. It's going to help you to not um, allow the enemy to pierce your vital organs, to strike you in the heart. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. If you think about the, the shoes, the boots that these Roman soldiers wore, they had like cleats on them so that they would drive in and they would stick if they were trying to be pushed back. It's just like a football team. Imagine some football players trying to play on some AstroTurf or some wet, wet grass without any cleats on, but the other side does have them. They're just going to smoke right through them, right? They're just going to push them right over because they have nothing to be able to stop them. Well, what stops us from being shoved back, from being taken down because we don't have sure footing? Look at it. The gospel of peace. Being willing to stand firm for peace. Being willing to allow peace to just be all up in us. To not get shaken. To not get... Um, Moved by all the pressures of the world coming against us to have peace. And then the shield of faith. The shield of faith. What's awesome is Paul's looking at these Roman soldiers. That's why he's using this as an example. He's, he sees them all the time. He was chained to them for years, literally. So he's looking at all the stuff that they have. Well, Roman soldiers, their shield, did you know that it wasn't for them? It was to protect the guy next to them. And the guy next to them, their shield was to protect them. Isn't that wild? So sometimes, guys, whenever we use the shield of faith, our faith can oftentimes protect the guy next to us, the people next to us, our family, you know, our brothers and our sisters in Christ Jesus. But if, if the enemy's shooting these flaming arrows... We can use that shield, the shield of faith, to protect us and to protect our brothers next to us, our brothers and our sisters in Christ. It says that these can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. It's pretty important to protect your dome, right? I mean, seriously. Doesn't take much to, uh, to cause some serious damage to your entire life if, you're, if your head gets taken out. Doesn't take a whole lot there. And it says this helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We've got to know the Word of God. We've got to trust the Word of God. Not just the, the pages. Guys, but the words that he speaks to us that goes deep down into our souls. And it's not going to contradict itself. If you are hearing a word that, that you think might be from the Lord, you can align it with the word of God. And if it lines up with the word of God, then that's, that's a pretty solid indication that it could absolutely be from, from God. But if it doesn't line up with the word of God and it contradicts, then guess what? The enemy's trying to throw you off. And he's trying to get in and cause dissension and division. Think about it. Think about it. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Are we praying? Are we taking our prayers and requests to the Lord? It's going to change your life going to change my life. It'll change all of our lives. It's absolutely paramount that we live a life of prayer. You know, whenever Jesus goes into the temple and he starts binding this whip with these cords, he's literally fashioning a whip. Jesus himself is fashioning a whip because he's enraged. He's getting very angry because people have taken his father's house, which is a house of prayer, and defiled it. 
people are like, Jesus was not, um, he was not a person that would, that would do something like that. Well, I beg to differ. He most absolutely was. He was not a pacifist by any means. He stood up for what was right. And they were defiling his house. He says, my father's house will be a house of prayer. And then he uses this whip and drives human beings out of it. We're all like, no, 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 no. Everybody that, that wants to come in here can come in here and do whatever they want. No, they can't. They absolutely can't, and they won't. If Jesus drove them out, well, then you better believe that that's his heart. Can they, can they be redeemed and renewed and, and delivered and come into a full knowledge of him? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why Jesus says whenever he was raised from the dead, he's with the disciples on the mountain and he, and he breathes into them. He, sa- it, it, he breathes onto them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, go into all nations, making disciples. Right? Making disciples. Some of those very people that he probably drove out maybe had an opportunity to come back to him. But he's not going to let his house be defiled. And we can't let his house be defiled. Just like if somebody's trying to come in and attack the U.S. embassies, do they get to do that? Because, well, we're in their country. We're in their land, you know, like we, we're kind of here on their property. No. If they come in to attack the U.S. Embassy, guess what happens? We take the fight to them very, very hard. Very hard. So, he says, in prayer and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. If we have needs... We need to take it to the Father in prayer. He says, with all kinds of requests. He wants that relationship. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to bring your needs and your fears and, and everything. He wants you to bring it to him. Talk to him about it. Give him an opportunity to be able to change it. Give him the opportunity to be able to change it. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Would he tell us to, to be alert if we didn't need to be alert? Would he tell us to be alert if there was nothing to be alert about? If it was okay to just, you know, just go with every, every flow of, of whatever we think? No. He says, be alert. Be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. He says the Lord's people here, guys, because... The Lord's people are under attack. Does this mean that we don't pray for um, the rest of the world? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that we have to be diligent and deliberate about lifting one another up, building one another up, strengthening one another, working together, keeping each other strong so that we can lean on each other and support each other. One can put 1,000 to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight. We need each other. He's created us for relationship. There's a uh, Hillsong United put out a song quite a while back, but it's, it says, uh, All I Need Is You, Lord. And it is super good. I was listening to it last night and this morning, just like, just weeping. And it really does come down to that, you know. He gives us all these things. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength, but he's the one that provides for us. And all we need is him. But if we let our eyes get fixed on something else, we're going to slip and we're going to fall. And it's a slippery slope, guys. It's real easy. And then there's another one that's uh, written by Christ for the nations. And it's the more I seek you, the more I find you. The more I seek you, the more I find you. King David, the most amazing warrior to ever live. He's praying and he's talking to God and he says, your word says, seek my face. 
Your face, O Lord, I will seek. And the word says that he was a man after God's own heart. That was truly his desire. He says, you tell me to seek your face and I'm going to seek your face. That's what I desire is more of you, God. So I just encourage you guys that when you feel the enemy trying to attack you, whenever you feel him coming against you and trying to um, cause strife and division and get your focus off of what God has for us and off of what God has for you, guys, seek his face. Seek his face. Stand together in unity. All right, why don't you all stand with me and we will, uh, we'll close out in prayer. And we will have some worship. Um, we'll kick it on back there. If you guys need to go, you can go ahead and go. If you want to stay and get into worship, you can. If you have anything that you need prayer for, don't hesitate to come up and receive prayer. Don't forget to pick your children up um, as we leave. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your direction and your truth. And thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to take our sins and our shame, Lord, to be that path, to be able to get to you, to be able to be with you and spend eternity with you because of what you've done, Lord. Help us to receive that into our hearts, into our minds, and into our souls, Lord. Help us to make it um, part of every single fiber of our being. Lord, I pray that we will represent you well, that we will be who you've called us to be, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what attacks the enemy tries to bring against us, Lord, I pray that we will um, surrender completely and totally to you, God. Lord, I pray that you will go before every single person here and every single person at the sound of my voice, that you will go before us, Lord, that you will prepare the way for us, God. You will help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, Lord. God, help us to remember that all we truly need is you. Lord, help us to love one another just like you loved us, Lord, just like you do love us. And we can love because you've loved us first. God, I pray that you will go before everybody today, that you will make their path straight for them, Lord, that you will uh, open eyes that need to be opened, Lord, that you will uh, make straight the way of the Lord. And I pray that you will give us divine appointments and opportunities to be able to share your love with those around us, God. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.